From Redwood Forest to the Big Apple, Shaolin Shuffle is the third map in our Infinite Warfare Zombies adventure. Following up on the maps before it, Shaolin further attempts to improve upon the ideas introduced in Spaceland and Rave. Featuring two powerful melee wonder weapons, four unique chi abilities, and a man covered in rats, Shaolin Shuffle sets itself up to be another stellar experience in the IW catalog. But why doesn't it? Well, hello there, fellow zombie slayers! My name is Stanley557. Thank you all for sticking with me as we further re review Infinite Warfare Zombies. So sit back and relax as we go over what makes the map so special and what holds it back more than its contemporaries. Disco ain't dead, and neither are the zombies, so let's see what Willard Weiler and the IW team have in store for us with Shaolin Shuffle. Shaolin Shuffle takes our characters to the far reaches of New York City, in the middle of the 1970s, where an undead outbreak has occurred and all that remains is the Black Cat Dojo, a martial arts facility helmed by Pam Greer, the map celebrity cameo. Together the groups will unite and take down the undead overlord known as the Rat King. But enough preamble, what's the story? After defeating the Super Slasher and grabbing a different piece of the soul key from the rave outro due to a continuity error, Point Dexter and the gang make their way to the next map. All of a sudden, Willard is heard laughing, and the map begins its short and contained story about Arthur McIntosh, the Rat King. After embezzling money and committing large amounts of fraud, Arthur McIntosh is found guilty for him and his corporation's crimes, and a manhunt ensues for the wealthy businessman. Attempting to escape his fate, he consumes an unknown vial of ooze, and combines his flesh with the rats around him, laughing away as he has discovered a newfound power, with the cutscene fading away as the map begins. I'm mixed on this intro and mixed is a phrase I'll be saying a ton during this review. I love the style and presentation of the police investigation. It's quick, it's flashy, and it doesn't waste the audience's time, and the speed of the story told matches the environment and the themes of the era. Short exposition and a ton of action. Arthur McIntosh is a simple villain, although an inconsequential one because he only exists in the fictional world of Willard's movies. But I guess Willard exists in the fictional world of IW too, so what do I know? What I don't like about the intro is the lack of Willard's presence. If anything, it feels as though an entire interaction with him was cut. Not only is nothing said, but it almost seems as though Willard is doing his nefarious laughter after a brief monologue like the one seen in Rave's intro. It's possible this was omitted for time, but the cutscene already moves at a brisk pace, and the lack of Willard's presence doesn't feel like it was originally intended by the writers, with the man himself having such little presence on the map as is. And following Macintosh's fusion into the Rat King, the map immediately begins, with very little foreword from our main cast besides what they say at the end of the rave outro. Again, our main characters are relegated to basically nothing but background entities in the environment and the era that they've entered. So from the short setup, let's talk about the characters as it's a topic I brushed over in Spaceland and completely ignored in Rave. Where are you? I want to point this out because we're three maps into the game and I can't exactly tell you anything about who our characters are, what are their motivations, and most importantly, what are their thoughts on their current predicament. For those unaware, our characters take on the personalities, backstories, and mannerisms of the stereotypes that they play. The easiest and most prominent examples come from Spaceland. Point Dexter plays a nerd, AJ a high school jock, Andre a rapper, and Sally a valley girl, with each of these personalities oozing into their quotes in the same way the Victus crew quotes work in transit. This type of characterization persists throughout the entirety of IW, and there's never really a moment where our characters interact with the world around them in a meaningful way. I understand the thought process behind this decision though. In the theming of IW, our characters are actors, so it makes sense that they become consumed by the role thrusted upon them as they enter the role of the film. You know, like actors. But there's never that moment of clarity, the linchpin that would have you say, Oh right, these are supposed to be real people. Now this doesn't have to be all too serious, if anything there isn't really an issue with these goofy nothing characters, but it just has me questioning why wouldn't I want to care about the playable characters? Wouldn't making these characters three dimensional only further engage people in your world? What further adds on to this is the character backstories you can find throughout the map as a small side easter egg as a part of the nunchuck quest. We'll get to that easter egg portion of it later, but let's talk about the character contents. 
In audio logs voiced by Willard, we learn little bits and pieces of our characters' backstories. Point Dexter comes from a broken home and is our Broadway master. AJ is an athletic dream child who yearns to be more than a pretty face on the big screen. Sally was raised by industry veterans and can never escape the shadow of said parents. And Andre is a kid from the Bronx who pursued theater in an attempt to make a name for himself. These are great starts, and there are a ton of interesting ways to apply these concepts to each of the maps. All of these characters come from broken homes or from places with absent family members, in the same way that Willard had just lost his daughter and wife. There is some base level application that could be applied between the two groups, and if anything, I just like to see the characters be real people. You actually have the beginnings of some real characterization with these four characters, but besides what we learn in the Shaolin backstories, we never get to hear anything else of it or how it could connect to a greater story with our characters. Now granted, as I talked about earlier, you don't need to have deep characterization, and this story doesn't have to take itself all too seriously, but if you can find ways to meld in our playable characters with the themes and stories of the worlds of the movies, it would make for a more engaging narrative. And so far, it always seems like the movies are completely absent from anything our characters have any involvement with or any personal stakes besides escaping. It makes it feel very difficult to get invested, and the two worlds never exactly line up. But that's enough about the characters, so let's move on to the map's level design and art style, which is also something I'm extremely mixed on. Let's start with the map's art style and overall direction. Much like Rave and Spaceland before it, Shaolin Shuffle takes on a completely different era of American filmmaking, this time tackling the 1970s, specifically the Kung Fu action craze. Just like its predecessor, the map is absolutely gorgeous, and it makes you wonder just how many unique assets were created for this location alone. Unlike the neon and sci-fi inspired designs of Spaceland and Rave, Shaolin goes for a much more grounded approach, and I feel the art team did a standout job designing the world of Shaolin Shuffle. From the buildings to the colors, the map absolutely stands out in the Zombies catalog, despite my original review lambasting the experience for just being set in the backwaters of New York City. While not something as unique as the locations and options chosen throughout BO2, 3, and 4, IW manages to use the genre hopping concept to its fullest, and like Black Ops 3, Every map thus far has featured a wide variety of locations, with each world visited carefully crafting an experience visually distinct from its counterparts, and I want to compliment that dedication, much like how I would compliment Treyarch in a BO3 review. Spaceland is full of pinks, Rave is full of purples and blues, and Shaolin is full of reds, browns, and yellows. From the map's art direction, let's talk about the layout, and how the map's various features complement and hinder it. Shaolin Shuffle features many box-like and modular arenas, and besides the Rat King Lair in the sewer, the map has numerous arenas, all diegetically designed like you're traversing through an actual city. While this helps immerse you in the world of Shaolin Shuffle, the gameplay suffers because of it. Lanes are tight, maneuverability is low, and the map tries to go for a more run-and-gun approach to the gameplay that limits the player's ability to train undead, and seeing as there's a ton of zombie spawns on the ground, the map actively encourages you to be forward in your advance against the undead horde. And this isn't a bad philosophy, but we'll talk about certain issues with how the enemies interact with the player once we get to the ninja zombies. Regardless, I find the design to have a form over function direction. While the map looks pretty and flows like a proper city, the design doesn't exactly flow well into gameplay, and most of the time the undead horde constantly pop into the player's path. And without defensive options like the shield or armor, it's easy to take unintentional downs. This constantly forces players to train in the sewers, easily the best location in the map to move around and train, but it fails to promote players to fully utilize the space that the developers created, and it doesn't help the space created doesn't match how the gameplay works and feels. Let's compare this to Go Ride Crophy, another tight city-like map that takes heavy creative liberties in its premise as a city. Using the destroyed aspect of a war-torn Stalingrad to their advantage, floors and buildings seamlessly flow into each other, and zombie spawns are always kept around corners and vertical spaces, allowing the undead the variable speed to randomly appear in front of and behind players as they fight through the space. What further adds on to this is how many different options each room presents players, always giving them consistent ways when attacking and escaping undead. In Shaolin Shuffle, too many lanes force players in a linear direction, 
and the areas that offer varied escape options are often too tight and close quartered to even be considered viable training options, like the top of the disco club or the rooftops by Stamina Up and Deadshot. For example, players are always incentivized to move to the next area, with the map featuring a ton of linear lanes that promote forward thinking, pushing you along throughout the experience by force rather than by player choice or decision. In another comparison that's more the game style, let's look back at Spaceland. The map constantly features open and wide spaces that promote using the space available to corral hordes and slip between tight spaces without issue. Areas are just as diegetically designed as Shaolin, but the map's more open layout properly suits the gameplay variety and linear direction. In Shaolin, the map design is overall messy, confusing, and poorly designed for the gun-like gameplay of IW. But that sliver's review is going to take a change compared to my other reviews, so let's talk about the chi abilities, the wonder weapons, and the map's infamous ninja zombies. This might get a bit confusing, but stay with me. I'm putting all of these sections together with the map layout because I want to talk about how they each complement and hinder the map layout and design. So let's talk about the chi abilities. Once players advance to round 5, they'll be able to speak with Pam Greer and consume one of four chi abilities. And by obtaining kills with specific chi abilities, players will be able to learn new powers and take down the horde in a ton of unique and fun ways. What makes these powers a ton of fun is the fact that each level and ability learned always one-shots any undead on the map, with each ability taking on the undead in a different way and consume the chi's power meter by different stages. This perfectly coincides with the running gun nature of the map. See an undead in your way? Well, it's quite easy to throw a ninja star or melee the undead directly in front of you. Want to take down the horde instantly? Well, use your super ability and watch your character go flying. As you level up chi abilities, you're rewarded with new ways to decimate the undead. It reminds me how overtuned equipment is in Cold War, and it's no different here. Once the energy runs out, players are required to wait 5 minutes, or until the end of the round, to use the chi powers again. What's also really nice is the ability to instantly transition back to using standard weaponry at the press of a button, giving players a ton of control over how they wish to use these powers. So let's go over them real quick. Each chi power comes with four abilities, a powerful melee, a shuriken star, a level 2 ability, and a super ability, with each ability costing more power depending on the level from 0 to 3. Starting with the tiger style, players can perform a standard melee, throw a red shuriken star, summon a black hole, and hulk out on the undead with a super ability. The crane style grants the same two abilities, a frost blast that randomly attacks 4 to 5 undead, and a crane kick that looks absolutely insane, but feels super satisfying to properly use. The dragon style features the same two abilities, a yellow frost blast ability that randomly targets 4 to 5 undead really running out of ideas guys, huh? And a dragon spiral that protects players for an extended period of time, while also annihilating any undead that enter this deadly vortex. And finally, there's a snake style, which features the same two ability levels, the power to summon a skeleton that can randomly defeat one or nine zombies, it kind of just does its own thing. And finally, a flurry of punches that hardly represents what it means to be a snake. But hey, what do I know? Last time I checked, snakes don't have arms. In practice, these powers are a lot of fun, but because of the energy bar, you either have to use all of your energy when you drink the chi, or give up on any energy you had left if you need to use a score streak, your normal weapons, or grenades, which is a real shame. And if anything, the chi ability should have been built into the character. Let me explain. I love the chi powers, but the fun is already over before you know it, and I would have loved to use them all the time as the gameplay perfectly fits with them. Instead of being limited use items per round, the chi ability should have been, well, abilities the player unlocks by using them. The melee should have become your standard melee with a short cooldown, the shuriken star should take your grenade slot, the level 2 ability should be your tactical grenade slot, and the super ability should be your right d-pad slot. Each ability should have its own cooldown, and you should be prompted as a player to intermix these abilities into your standard combat. And if they did that, I believe Shaolin would have invented its own new style of gameplay well ahead of its time before games like Cold War and Modern Warfare 3 Zombies. But to summarize, yeah, these abilities are really neat, if not held back by how quickly the fun is over. And it's a shame I completely wrote them off when originally writing my first Shaolin review. If there's any reason to play Shaolin, it's to give these abilities a try. And the other problem that holds back these abilities is the game's dodgy melee hitbox system and the high undead aggression. 
Despite how fun it is to attack on dead, one simple screw up can lead to your early demise. And this is sadly unavoidable due to the way the game is designed from the ground up. Then there's those wonder weapons. Just like the Chi abilities, the map's wonder weapons are melee inspired powerhouses that instantly one shot just about any undead that they come into contact with. And just like the Chi abilities, are a lot of fun to use and complement the type map design. Let's start out with the nunchucks, as they're obtained by completing a small side easter egg. By interacting with these clocks, and mailing specific items found around the map, you'll be able to access the map's character bios. Following up further, players can interact with some TVs, kill some ninja zombies, and melee the clocks once more to receive a special fire cell power-up that always grants the nunchucks to the player who has completed the side easter egg. The nunchucks are an incredibly powerful melee wonder weapon, and besides the one-inch punch, and specialists like the Apothecon Sword, is the first true melee wonder weapon in the series. The weapon is as easy to use as pressing the right trigger over and over again. Simply go wild with the button and watch the undead around you turn into a pure red mist. Until round 32 where it stops one-shotting. See a group of zombies? Give them the old Bruce Lee one-two. See a ninja zombie? Well let that demon know who's boss and send him back to the 70s. This weapon is truly one of a kind and a lot of fun to use. Once back a punch, the weapon creates small shockwaves when interacting with the undead that further kill more enemies in one shot, slows them down, and gives the weapon an increased killing potential and fun factor. Skipping around in our script, let's talk a bit about the other wonder weapon and the map's easter egg reward, the katana. After completing the map's main quest, the katana is always awarded to players in the Black Cat Dojo for 10,000 points a pop. Just like the nunchucks, the katana can be used to decimate the undead. And unlike the chainsaw found in Brave in the Redwoods, the katana can be bought once the easter egg has been completed once, permanently giving players a new option whether in or out of director's cut. Whereas the chainsaw can only be bought once the easter egg is complete, or if director's cut is turned on. And once pack-a-punched, the weapon has the ability to produce long range blasts of energy, which can be charged up by simply slashing the weapon twice, with the third strike producing this deadly shot. In tandem, these two wonder weapons, plus the chi abilities, make you a deadly force of kung fu nature. And genuinely, once you're completely set up, playing around is a lot of fun. Like I referenced earlier, this style of gameplay was ahead of its time, and it seemed as though Lee Ross and his team were actually evolving the series in a unique way. Probably the only flaw with how all of these systems work with each other is the fact that this is the best and only strategy that can be effectively used to survive high rounds. Standard Weaponry in IW wasn't exactly the most effective against enemies that constantly pop up in front of you. So let's talk about Shaolin's most infamous feature. You know him, I know him, and ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's talk about the most annoying enemy in Call of Duty Zombies, the Ninja Zombie. Dealing high damage, the ability to teleport in and out of thin air, and quite literally the power to avoid damage entirely, the Ninja Zombie is immune to most standard weaponry produced by players. Shoot at them? Well, they'll simply teleport out of the way. Want to get away yourself? Well, don't do that, as the Ninja Zombie's AI is activated by the input caused by the run button. Think you can kill them before they kill you? Well, there's another problem. Because they are special enemies, the Ninja Zombie gets an increased health boost per round higher than the standard undead, making them exponentially more difficult to take down as the rounds increase. And because these enemies can spawn in with the standard horde, they constantly pop in and out of gameplay. These enemies are a nightmare to deal with on their own for an experienced player, and for a casual one, the map becomes nigh unplayable once the game reaches round 20. This is further compounded with the diegetic map design, and you get a frustrating experience that rewards the dominant strategy and unfairly punishes those who can't quite keep up. There's nearly zero counterplay, and I cannot fathom how much I despise these enemies. Thankfully, they don't appear on any other maps where their interactions with the rest of the enemy pool is completely contradictory to the rest of the special enemies on the map. Right? But I guess we'll get there when we get there, won't we? In any case, you have all these puzzle pieces of gameplay trying to fit together. And just like the rest of the map, I'm mixed on it. Some of it works, and some of it doesn't. What really works, works phenomenally. But what doesn't work, really doesn't work and the ninja zombies needed another run through in development because it just makes you wonder who came up with these guys and why they do what they do. 
It doesn't help that the best counter to them, the nunchucks and the katana, are only obtainable through a special side quest and a main quest run through respectively. And while the cheat abilities are a good counter in of themselves, they hardly last long enough to be used for the entire round. And much less if you need to switch it out early to use any of your other equipment or weaponry, leading you to no longer be able to use it for the rest of the round. And with all of these options extinguished, players are now incentivized to camp. And while camping is quite effective, an enemy that completely shuts down an entire style of gameplay should be condemned for its inclusion. But that's enough about all that. In short, the gameplay works except when it doesn't and becomes an inexcusable nightmare. And that's the basic gameplay loop of Shallon Shuffle. I went over this by itself because the basic gameplay loop incorporates the map's primary features, all binded together in one package. And if you ask me, this is a really good way to sum up Shallon Shuffle when you ignore all its extraneous features. You have an interesting gameplay loop designed around powerful and useful abilities, but some of them are locked behind side quest, one behind the main quest, and one is a limited time item held back by the system that it's trapped in. And of course you have ninja zombies, which completely destroy the ability to train, as if that's even an option, inside of the map, and because they constantly spawn in and out of gameplay, it's difficult to use the chi abilities as a counter because chi only lasts for so long, and if you stop using it early, you can't use it later. And then there's the map layout itself, which is tight, hard maneuverability, and very difficult to use if you're not using the aforementioned dominant strategy, which I feel like really hurts the creativity that Spaceland and Rave started up with, and now it seems like in Shaolin, all that momentum is nearly gone. And it just makes you wonder, how did we get here? Getting back on track, let's go over the map in more detail and what I left out. Up next, there's the score streak system. In place of the prize machine and the gem totem, there's the mahjong tile system. Another feature on the map I'm completely mixed on. To build items like the boom box and the all new lava lamp score streak, players have to traverse the map and find three tiny mahjong tiles you will most likely completely miss because they are hardly noticeable to the naked eye. Even if you know where they are, the tiles are way too tiny and make no noticeable indicator when you are near them, and you just kind of have to know where they are. For example, I'd like those of you out there to look at this screen cap of the game and figure out where the Mahjong tile is. If you found it, congrats! Now try finding this tile while in the middle of gameplay. It's almost indistinguishable from the rest of the litter on the ground, and much like the charm system in Rave, these tiles feel like completely inconspicuous items with little value. But if you somehow manage to find all three tiles, or just look up a guide, you'll be rewarded with one of the map's numerous score streaks. There's the returning boombox and sentry, just as useful as ever, at least the boombox is. Alongside these items, there are some new ones like the toy robot, zombie gone, and the aforementioned lava lamp. The toy robot is a tiny ally who packs a real punch. Placing him down, our robotic buddy will fire out homing missiles and stun grenades to keep the undead off your tail. By the time you reach round 20 though, he won't be doing much, but he's a cute little addition to your arsenal, and honestly is a better sentry gun. The Lava Lamp is a timed explosive that leaves behind a decaying pool of molten magma that kills any undead that run over it. Useful for holding a choke point, but doesn't last long, and due to enemies constantly spawning around the player, the choke point created will only work for so long. And finally, there's Zombie Gun, a tactical grenade that repels undead that get close to its thrown radius. The item is perfect for reviving teammates, assuming of course it doesn't bounce off their corpse and fail to activate, because that totally won't happen. What makes this system fun is the fact that once the Mahjong tiles are placed, the score streak will continually respawn after a full round has passed, allowing you to constantly experiment with each of the different items without much consequence, unlike the gem and coin systems from Rave and Spaceland, which hinged on the RNG of the items retrieved from the undead. So while they might be middle of the road items, they can be used whenever the player wants, which I really appreciate. Just wish you didn't have to find these Mahjong tiles, it's easily the system's biggest drawback. Then there's the game's newest perk, Dead Eye Dewdrops. Now if you use this ability, then you know it's one of the best new perks ever introduced in the series. On top of snapping your ADS to the head, the ability completely negates all recoil when aiming down sight and hip firing making your weapon an unstoppable sentry turret. This perk would be good with that alone, but if that wasn't enough, 
Aiming down sights for an extended period of time activates an additional damage buff that persists as long as players continue to hold down the aim down sight button. This is one of the few ways for players to increase their damage and becomes an amazing option for just about any type of player. Even if you're not taking advantage of a camping strategy, the lack of recoil and the damage buff make the perk just as suitable for training. If there's any downside I can mention, it's the fact that it's too valuable not to take with you, further increasing perk creativity and setup. Now, let's bounce back to the enemies. In a one-to-one -one copy of the Clown Zombie, Shaolin Shuffle introduces the Roller Skater Zombie. M my mistake, probably they're called Skating Divas. Anyways, just like the Clown Zombie, Roller Skaters run up to players in sets of two and explode upon reaching close proximity. These zombies are so closely related to their clown counterparts that even their animations glitch out the same when leading to the game. Just like the clowns, the roller skaters can appear alongside normal undead later into the game. These zombies are nothing more than popcorn enemies, and unlike the parasites or hellhounds found in games like Black Ops 3, it really seems like Lee Ross and his team completely misunderstand what makes these enemies dangerous in the first place. Then before we go into the easter egg and ghosts and skulls, let's go over the nitpicks. The disco nightclub bottom floor might be one of the worst rooms in the entirety of zombies. What seems like a deceptively easy room to train in soon becomes a torture chamber. Due to the undead constantly bouncing up and down from the rafters and the second floor above the players, a ton of large undead hitboxes are constantly shifting around the room, and it's really easy to take an unfair down simply because you're at the wrong place at the wrong time. Or if it's just at the wrong place at even the right time, and guess what, you're just gonna go bouncing in the other direction. If you have Shaolin, I'd highly recommend going into the room and attempt to train for an extended period of time, and see for yourself just how messy the gameplay can be, because I don't believe I can properly do it justice in this review. Other cool features include the train in the subway, which can just kill you, a feature required for Ghosts and Skulls. The setup process is atrocious, because it requires you to find random and obscure items that can be hidden all around the map, like the pink flyer which has a location in every corner of the map. On the flip side, there's a special entry coin, needed to access Pack-a-Punch found beneath the Tough Enough perk machine, which is a nice reference to Darice. And finally, there's the film reel case, which also has four distinct locations around the map. This pack unlock process is often criticized for its obscurity, and something I want to reiterate in the re-review. Why this was done the way it was done is beyond me besides Lee Ross and his team wanting players to look up YouTube guides for this map. Then there's the glitches, particularly the way special enemies can throw you out of the map. I'm only bringing this up in Shaolin because it's the only time where this has happened to me naturally in gameplay, but this can be achieved in any IW map where special enemies teleport into the map, which is all of them. But honestly, going outside the map is awesome. I love being able to peel back the layers of development like this. Also, this happened. For those unaware, up is not the intended direction. And finally, there's the fast travel system, which are unlocked by using the Chi abilities, which I think is a really good feature, and each of them sports fantastic routes while also being required for features like Double Pack-a-Punch. What I love about it is that it actually allows progression to be tied to an item in-game, much like the dynamite barriers found all the way in Dr. Toten. And with that, let's talk about the main quest. Shaolin Shuffle follows our heroes as they empower their hearts, bodies, and minds to defeat the Rat King. Sadly, there's very little narrative through line as each of these steps players must do to accomplish their goal is completely nonsensical. Stuff that zombies often gets caricatured for doing actually happens in this main quest. Collect the thingamabobs to unlock the uberglurkin, where you must fight the map's boss and complete the main quest. Yeah, it's one of those quest lines. For starters, players must unlock the chi abilities and hunt down rat cages around the map. By throwing shuriken stars at them, players can encounter the event known as Rat High Five, a moment where you can get two low poly rats to walk by each other and high five while you simultaneously ignore donations about how inspiring you are to others. Down here, I think he's going down here. Let me let me, let me just save you some time here. Let me go ahead and. Noah, I love you. Don't tell my girlfriend, J.K. But really though, you make my day whenever you stream, and I bet I'm not the only right, one who feels like that's true. I just wanted to say that. In any case, look at these adorable little goobers. I love them. On a side note, there's no reason the model should look anything like this in a triple A major franchise. But 
God, I love that it looks the way it does. If anything, its movements are emblematic of a bygone era in gaming. Or, or something like that, who cares? After sifting around the rats, you'll uncover a soul circle, which summons ninja zombies that grant you a locker key. With the key in tow, you must now scour the map for Chinese symbols that spell out the word soul. After doing all of that, you can begin your first encounter with the Rat King. What I enjoy about these in-run boss fights is that you actually get to encounter the boss in a non-endgame environment and learn from his attacks and movesets as they evolve throughout the main quest. The Rat King can shoot a bolt of debris at you with his staff, raise a sewer grate like a shield and deflect all damage, throw said shield like Captain America, and summon a horde of ninja zombies that must be quickly dispatched or else all hell breaks loose. These encounters are usually short, but get the job more than done, and are arguably the best part about the egg because, you know, you're actually fighting something. When defeated for the first time, the Rat King will drop an eyeball. To continue the quest, players must first talk to Pam Greer, and then go searching between one of 13 locations six times to look for a rat symbol, which can only be seen temporarily when activating the eye ability, which now takes up the tactical slot for the rest of the game. Once the first symbol is found, players only now need to recheck the remaining 12 locations, and so on and so forth until six symbols are found. I'm going into this easter egg so in depth because it's emblematic of poor design process that was previously only seen in Ghosts and Skulls in Spaceland and Rave, with each of these side quests being difficult to learn due to their obscure nature. This made it more difficult for players to complete the quest and further keep the hunt alive and hype for the game going. This design philosophy was pioneered by Jason Blundell and his team during Black Ops 3, with the most notable example being the bone step on Revelations, which was designed to purposely slow down the main hunt at the end of BO3's life cycle. And following how quick and easy it was to solve Spaceland and Rave's quest, with the latter previously holding the record for the fastest main quest hunt, Lee Ross and his team took it upon themselves to make the main quest more difficult to further extend the main quest hunt. This decision is most evident with Shaolin and Attack's main quest, with Attack's infamous chemistry step and Shaolin's numerous to solve difficult easter egg steps, such as the eyeball step. The activation of the eyeball only lasts for a few seconds, and with the symbol players need to shoot showing up in 13 separate locations, one at a time, and in often hard to spot locations, further increasing how absurd the main quest is and his subsequent hunt actually were. When I think of horrible main quests, Shaolin is one that immediately pops into my mind because it sacrifices player enjoyment for the sake of hype and buildup that doesn't exactly translate well on multiple playthroughs. This could have been solved by, you know, keeping fun in mind when designing the quest, but what do I know? For those unaware, let's go over some of my favorite locations. There's the rat symbol hiding out of bounds behind the subway station, the symbol tucked away in a faraway building, also out of bounds, which could only be seen if you knew it was there. And who could forget about the other out of bounds spot, which can only be seen when jumping and can be easily obscured by the undead spawning. When six symbols have been found, players can interact with the one remaining phone location and decipher Morse code. <laughs> Solving said Morse code gives you a code for a poster you must find around the map. And fun fact, if you grab the wrong poster, you have to redo the entire eye symbol step all over again. I cannot exaggerate how much of a pain this is, because when it happens, you just get to redo the step all over again. And by golly, do I just want to blow my brains out when that happens. Once you place the correct poster, blow open this random window with explosive weapon and kill those ninja zombies. And then you can start the devil word step. By walking around the top of the disco, players have to translate and decipher symbols in the devil's alphabet and spell an appropriate word. For example, the game will give you a starting letter and you have to solve which word it could be with the word bank not being given to players. Usually the words are associated with figures, places, and characters in IW and Ghost's Extinction. In this example, my word starts with the letter D. When solving the quest, the word can be dance, David Archer, Death, Director, Disco, Dragon, or Dr. Cross. This makes the process for solving the step infuriating, and if you guess wrong or input the wrong symbol, the word changes, and if you fail too many times in a round, you are forced to wait until the next round to try again. I cannot express how unfathomably stupid this step is, and if my long-winded explanation isn't enough, then I recommend going into it without a guide of any kind and try to solve the step. 
It seems nonsensical, and as stated previously, was only created the way it was to further extend the time it would take to solve, which insults the player's time at every turn. What I dislike about the Shaolin word step is that you don't have to translate devil alphabet words into English letters, but then also check your words based off of the letters provided to you. For example, let's say my word is David Archer. Well, that word also lines up with the word dance. So if I see the A symbol, I have to input both D and A. The word can now either be dance or David Archer. That means that if I find both letters N and V in my available letter layout, which can happen, you have to perform a 50-50 guess. And if you fail this guess, for example, my word was David Archer, if I had found the letter N and clicked that, that would have failed the step and I would have had to try with a completely separate word. I cannot fathom why that is the way it is, besides purposely extending the hunt. That is insane. And there is no other Easter egg in zombies besides maybe the torture path rune wall that does things to the absurd level that this does, being unfairly and unfathomably rude to players for no reason. And I'm being very explicit during this, this is off script at this point, because I find it's very insulting to my time, to your time, and it just seems like it doesn't seem to respect what makes Easter eggs fun. After completing the step, players can fight the Rat King a second time, where you take the man's brain. And honestly, after completing those steps, I might as well be considered as brain dead as the undead as well. After this, you are then required to talk to Pam, and once you complete two full rounds, the game will skip ahead three rounds in the style of a film reel missing footage. Honestly, it's a creative use of the round and theming concept, and the animation is done really well. It always catches me off guard. Once you're skipped ahead, players have to defend themselves against a small horde of the undead. After turning a turns dial, I seriously have no idea why you need to insert this back into the machine at spawn, you must now fill some soul circles and begin another fun step. Now players must head into the nightclub and train inside the dance hall and kill one zombie at a time, transferring the disco ball above the undead's head to another undead, carefully making sure that when the zombie with the disco ball is killed, another undead is standing on the dance floor to take its limelight. And when I say it has to be standing on the floor, you cannot have a zombie rolling on the ground. It has to be in a standing animation for it to count. While simple on paper, the disco ball is often finicky and will constantly fail players if you aren't careful. It doesn't help the parameters for this step are poorly laid out as well. This is once again further compounded with how poorly designed the AI routing is in this room, constantly jumping up and down to make this arena more difficult to train than it has to be. But if you manage to survive, you just have to defeat the Rat King one more time, claiming his heart as a usable weapon? A bit weird, but hey, it's fun to use. With the press of a right bumper, four to five zombies will always die, adding another useful piece of equipment to the player's arsenal, with the only drawback being that you need to complete 80% of the Easter egg to claim it. And with that, you can finally head into the boss fight, which is more of a mini boss fight than anything. After joining forces with Pam and damaging the Rat King, players must now complete one of three mini games, with each phase split between completing these tasks and damaging the boss. The eyeball phase requires players to shoot all the symbols surrounding the arena in a short time, using the eyeball power up to temporarily reveal where they are. If at any point players run out of ammo, they are permanently softlocked with no way to progress through the step. Yeah, this is fine. Just like Spaceland, the developers for some reason never account for what happens if a player fails an ammo dependent step, and just for some reason throws them to the wolves. The brain step will have turned undead slowly eat away at the brain of the Rat King, who will temporarily interrupt their feast and stop you at every turn. You can shoot at him to make him stop, or just continue to train circles around him. Really, there's no real threat during this step. And finally, there's the heart step, which requires a zombie to be killed in every acid pool around the arena. If players fail to do so in time, the step will reset, and if you run out of ammo, you're completely out of luck. The acid does do damage to players over time, making it difficult to complete the step without risk of unintentionally downing yourself. This here is one of the few steps where I'd rather just use a fate and fortune card, as the alternative option is unreliable and can potentially softlock you if you aren't careful. And after doing all this busy work and shooting at the Rat King a whole bunch of times, the man himself will come back down for one final brawl, where he's defeated just as quickly as usual. 
Once downed, the map's outro cutscene will play, and Arthur McIntosh will be defeated by Pam Greer. After being allowed access to her weapon, our characters grab the piece of the soul key, which Pam had? The Rat King had? Did the rats own the soul key? I, I don't know, it's never explained. Thus finally ending this mouse-infested experience. On a side note, in the boss fight, Pam can revive you if you go down, much like Hasselhoff on Spaceland. And by breaking various boxes around the arena, either using the Chi abilities or letting the Rat King throw his shield around the arena, players can have the opportunity to find three of the five core perks in case they go down. So sometimes you can just be screwed out of getting Jug back. But that's the Shaolin Shuffle main quest. What an absolute mess. Barely taking advantage of the setting, wonder weapons, or mechanics, and having long and convoluted steps that hardly connect to an overarching narrative, the map's main quest is more Google documents and guides than it is about actually killing zombies. And it's a real shame the developers indulged in this main quest hunt mania rather than making difficult, albeit rewarding main quests like Spaceland and Rave. And it's a shame that I have to describe and criticize the map like this, because I feel this could have been avoided while better incorporating the map's main features into the quest line, like the Chi abilities. All you do with them is level them up to level 1 and throw shuriken stars at rat cages. Even unlocking a unique ability, which could have only been obtained by playing through the main quest, would have gone a long way. But at this point, I'm running circles, so let's finish this off with Ghosts and Skulls. You know, for once, I'm happy to report the best part of the quest was actually playing Ghosts and Skulls for once, but we'll get there in a moment. Just like the main quest, and the ones before it, Skull Buster features many obtuse and arbitrary steps that must be completed in a sequence to gain access to the Ghosts and Skulls minigame. In a prequel to the Space Land classic, the first skull requires players to locate glass cleaner and a wash rag. This is as easy as looking up where the items are and applying them to the machine. The second skull now demands players to play a game of Mahjong at the rooftop disco. I'll simplify it like this. You just need to create four sequences of three and end the sequence with two of the same piece, traveling around the map to locate additional pieces to add to the board. Sequences can be as easy as having up to three of the same symbol, or a sequence of symbols like 2, 3, 4. This requires players to look up where the additional pieces can be, and a Mahjong solver that gives you an easy answer based off the pieces that you have. This is a complete slog to solve, and just like trying to find the Mahjong tiles needed to create the score streaks, these Mahjong tiles blend into the environment as well, leading to a step that takes a long time to solve for a first time player, and just like the main quest, requires a solver to make the step easier. It also doesn't help that when you look up Shaolin Shuffle Mahjong step, you get the Mahjong tiles for the score streaks, not the Mahjong tiles for the ghost and skull step, and that level of confusion alone just annoys me. Skull 3 then has players traverse the map and spell out the numbers 1972 in various windowsills, if you accidentally shoot a wrong window pane or run out of time, the step will instantly fail and you'll have to wait until next round to try again. And if you know me, you know that I have the aim of a fish with a gun. But any normal player should be able to complete the step fine, although having to wait till the next round to try the step again is always something I despise. The fourth skull has players complete parkour above the rooftops by stamina up, with each failed attempt forcing you to wait till the next round to try again. And, considering that you only get one chance per round with this extremely finicky step, it's rather difficult to practice and get better as each attempt is spread out by the rounds players must complete. Just like the main quest, this was clearly done to extend the Ghost and Skulls hunt, and I am absolutely sick of this development mentality. And considering high rounds on Shaolin are nearly impossible due to the ninja zombies, you might as well reset once you reach the 30s, if you are unable to complete this step. It doesn't look all too difficult, but only getting one chance per round is asinine and produces a game where I'm on round 43 and still haven't completed the step. And if you're in solo, then you have to find a way to stall the zombie as the undead can travel the invisible path you can't use. But if you manage to complete the step, the last two are as easy as jump in front of a train and the final skull requires you to call customer support found on the front of the screen. A cute final step that fits the theme of the map. And doesn't feel like some obscure step, like downing yourself in front of a train. And by the way, if you're in solo and you have no more up and atoms, by the time you reach the fifth skull, you are soft locked out of the step, which I love. So let's talk about the Ghost and Skulls game itself. 
Skullbuster requires players to fill in the blanks and complete a set of three skulls, guessing and using context clues to figure out which hidden symbols are which. What makes this game so easy is the density of skulls, which have been heavily reduced from its past iterations. What's interesting is that none of the steps require any undead to be killed, so it's possible to do the entire Ghosts and Skulls quest in just one round, barring you don't fill the window or parkour step, which is easier said than done. And that's Skullbusters. While the steps are just as poor as the ones that came before it, I'm glad to write that the minigame was a lot of fun, leaving Ghosts and Skulls a 1 for 3 in terms of being a fun side quest. Although the parkour step makes you want to hate it, especially when you consider the step can only be attempted once per round. But honestly, after recording for 4 hours, I'm just happy to get it over with. Which is never a good sign. And that's Shaolin Shuffle, a map I think has some good ideas and just as many bad ones, if not more so. An experience that looks beautiful and sports just as much content as the maps that came before it. An impression I've never had until I actually re-reviewed and explored all the different functions and unique attributes of the map. There are parts of the gameplay that work together, but there are just as many that don't. The map design promotes powers like the Chi abilities and the Wonder Weapons, but if you don't use said items, then the map becomes nearly unplayable in the high rounds due to the aggressive AI that attempts to spawn in front of you at every turn. The Ninja Zombies are some of the worst enemies in the series and truly bring being a terrible enemy to a whole new level. Training and mid-round traversal becomes nigh impossible once the rounds get way too high, and it's baffling to think these enemies were brought back in Beast from Beyond. The Chi abilities are a ton of fun and were ahead of their time, but are trapped in a system that doesn't fully support them. The additional unlocks, like the score streaks, are a great renewable system, but require you to locate tiny mahjong tiles that might as well make the system completely invisible to the casual player. The Ghosts and Skulls quest is as arbitrary as ever, although the minigame itself is surprisingly a lot of fun, and the main quest might be one of the worst in the entire series, with guides galore needed for even experienced players, with a design philosophy that incentivized hype and confusion rather than fun. You cannot look me in the eyes and tell me that the word puzzle or the eye symbol hunt were steps the developers genuinely intended to be engaging. The boss fight feels directionless and one of the few that can easily softlock the player if things don't go their way. The nunchucks and the katana are cool rewards and are a lot of fun to use. And then there's the characters who finally get somewhat fleshed out, even if it's just a little bit. But it's a shame Willard hardly has a presence on the map. There were times when writing the re-review, I had to remind myself, right, where's the main antagonist? While I enjoy aspects of Shaolin Shuffle, it's a shame I have to report back that this map is a steep decline in quality from its predecessors, with there sadly being more problems than there are positives. But with that said, thank you for watching. Join me next time with part 4 as we head back to the 1950s to fight a radioactive thing. Ah, what the hell is wrong with you? That is not how the scene was supposed to be shot. Thank you all for watching. This is only part 3 of my Infinite Warfare Zombies re-review. So subscribe so you can stay up to date as to when I release my re-review of Attack of the Radioactive Thing. If you like this video, then I can't recommend enough my other reviews of AW, World War II, Cold War, and Black Ops 4's 9. And if you're looking for something different, how about my historical roundup of all the cut content found in the series? But with all that said, thank you all for watching. And remember, keep on slaying.